are you doing the camera or just, you're not doing the camera, are you? Just the camera? Oh, but we're recording, we're getting the volume off of it too. Okay, because I'm not really moving. You're just doing a wide, how far can I walk, George, in case I walk? Oh, that's cool. Right about there, same way on the other side. You can still see me here? Okay, good, just so I know. All right. All right, again, for those that um, got the application, fill that out um, completely and bring that back next week, and you can turn that into us next week, okay? And um, we'll fill that out. We'll, I'm sorry, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, I'll tell you how we're going to handle that. Let's pray real fast so we don't have any confusion. We need the Spirit of God with us. Father, we thank you for tonight. We bless you, honor you, and adore you. We love you so much, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us even when we weren't lovable. We thank you for this second training tonight for small groups. And Holy Spirit, I ask you just to be with us and lead us and guide us, direct us, empower these precious people at another level as they're gearing up to minister to the many people that are coming through these doors. So we give you praise and honor and glory, and we just submit to your authority and rulership tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, for um, the ones that weren't here, Um, You need to get a copy of the first lesson um, from last week. Get a copy of that. We taught on um, leadership last week, the fundamentals of leadership within the vision, and you need to get a copy of that. Um, And where can they get that from? Okay, they don't need it now. We don't need it now. You can get it afterwards. Now, what you need, though, in addition, is you need the CD recording, and you can get that from Sister Sarah at the tape table. So you can just talk to her, tell her, just two, I think, right now. Just two. Um, you can tell Sister Sarah that you need um, the you need the CD recording from the first small group training. Okay, the two y'all did y'all hear that? And she'll you'll be able to get that. That way you'll have the outline, the fill in the blank sheet, plus you'll have the recording, so you can be caught up because it is vitally important. Last week's lesson, <clears throat> we didn't really talk about small group at all. We talked about leadership because leadership is pivotal um, to what we're going after with small group. So we didn't teach small group um, at all last week. So you didn't miss any dynamics of small group, but you did miss the dynamics of the leadership aspect that I want you to get. So please make a commitment to go back. Um, Elder Alana is going to put in your hands the um, lesson that I taught, but you'll need the recorded message. Brother Ron, do you um, have, did you, were you here last week? Okay. Um. Can you, uh, what is, what is, the, that's the application? No, you have the application, right? Okay, do you have that with you? Did you turn that in? I think I saw your name. Did I see your name? Yeah. Okay. You have that? Okay. Okay. All right. Hold on to that. Honey. Okay. Um, if you, when you come across, I don't know why, I, th- I, no, I didn't see yours. I don't know why. Did you turn yours in already? Okay, you have yours? Okay. Um, now, um, again, and, uh, oh, L.D. Alanda, uh, Brother Ron. It's very same Minister Ron. Uh oh. Brother Ron needs one too. Brother Ron needs one. Okay. No, he wasn't here when you went back. Um, again, for the the three, um, make sure you get you, you're gonna ha- you should have the lesson and get the recorded message from the tape table on um, I don't know if they can give it to you tomorrow night if you're here or Sunday. Just identify what you need because I need you guys to be caught up because the lesson was pivotal um, in where we're going. Again, we didn't touch small group dynamics at all. We dealt with leadership because of uh, the, the importance of um, our small group leaders being on the same page with us concerning leadership. We will dive into small group tonight um, shortly. Now, um, we do need to begin. We're going to end class starting tonight for the, re- for the next three weeks, and it will be over the training, the initial training. We're going to end at 7.30, and we, I'm sorry, 8.30, and we are going to then do interviews, and we're only going to be able to do two per night. Um, and f- between now, next week, the following, we're going to be ending at 8.30 um, promptly so we can go ahead and go into the interviews and get them done by 9 o'clock. So we're going to need two people to hang out every um, session for 30 minutes. We're going to do 15-minute rotation, and uh, that'll be it. If we don't finish the process, we are going to do um, a Saturday because everybody here understands that if you're going to be a small group leader, um, there will then be ongoing monthly training 
on the first Saturday of the month at 5 o'clock. Um, and then we have our general leadership training at 6 o'clock. So um, for our small group leaders, it'll be 5 to 8 for an hour of small group training and then 6 to 8 pouring into you as part of our leadership that are here. So our game plan is, uh, if we don't get them all done, to then the first Saturday ask the last two people to come at 4.30, knock out those interviews, and then go into the group training. Has everybody got that? Did, it, did you have a question, Nafisa? Oh, okay. All right. So um, tonight, who's the two that could do tonight? Okay. All right. All right. So, all right, we have a bunch of people that could do tonight. Okay. So at the end, we'll just kind of say, okay, we'll just kind of, Pastor Aisha will call out who uh, we had. Um, okay, Edie could do it. Um, I'm going. <laughs> Lydia, <laughs> Nafisa, um, Michelle. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brother Rothwell said he could. So, all right, we'll um, handle that at the end, okay? So we will, for the others, we'll dismiss at 8.30, and, um, um, and then uh, we'll ta ask the two um, that are being interviewed just to review your application and go from there, okay? All right, um, that, I think that's it for now. Okay, now, some of the other things, um, just that, well, we can talk about that in the interview. Well, in case, just um, um, Sister Elise, um, did, you, did you just give her, what did you give her? Okay, tonight we need another one, Elder. You need to just grab her, keep someone with you. For just before we leave, give um, Elise one, okay? Sister Elise. Sister Elise, um, what you need to get, your Elder Yolanda, before you leave, is going to um, is gonna give you the lesson from last week. And you're going to need to um, see Sister Sarah at the product table to get the recorded message, okay, from, um, from last week, okay? Now, if you weren't here, um, you know, you need to talk to her and get that from from her, okay? Has everybody got it? Okay, we won't charge you for that. We're not, are we charging them for that? We're not charging them for that, for um, if the people that need to get it from last week that weren't here? No, okay, we, no, no? I'll talk to Sister Sarah between now and then. I don't think we are, okay? If it would be $5 if we were, but I don't, I don't think we are for the training, okay? So we'll, um, I don't think we are. So um, you just need to get that, okay? Now, one last thing. In the applications, we noticed that, um, I don't know if people were getting mixed up um, when it said, would you like to be a facilitator or a host? And um, facilitator means you actually want to lead the group. Host means you're willing to open your home for somebody to put a group in there. So have I got that? And so uh, we can work through it in the, in the interviews, but I didn't know if some people were getting mixed up about it. Now, I think some people put... Um, somebody put no, or a few people may put no for either one. Um, you should only be in here if you're considering either one of them, okay, either hosting. And hosting, um, you're not going through the training. You don't have to go through the training as a host. If you're seriously considering facilitating, that's why you need to be in here. Everybody got it? Okay, now at the end, um, no, nobody, we've never forced anybody, but I really hope that I'll, most will say, hey, I want to do it. But um, if you're not interested in either, then you don't need to be um, in this. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, yeah. if you are possibly going to, let's say you can do it now, you're going to do it in the future, get the training out the way. But I need some folks that can do it, you know, now for what we're trying to get up and run it. Okay? Everybody got it? All right. Praise God for um, that. Um, I think that's it. Okay. All right. Let's um, go ahead. Any questions before we start? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you get a copy in your interview? We'll give you, yeah. Yeah, we can do that if you want it. Yeah, why do you want it? Now you got my curiosity. Okay, no, you can. Just remind us in the interview. Yeah, no problem. No problem. All right, Pray. any other questions from anybody? Yes. Are you not even in it? Oh, your securities, okay. Okay, oh, you are? All right, so you're going to depend on your wife tonight then. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, all right. Now, tonight's lesson is um, fundamentals of small group vision. Tonight, just so you know, and so you kind of know where we're headed because I, I don't want you to, um, oh, this is yours. There you go. You leaving stuff in my binder? That's good. You looking for that? I know you were. I know, I know, I know. Um, just so you guys know where we're headed, okay? Tonight, we're going to talk about fundamentals of small group vision. We're really going to begin to zone in more specific on the vision for small group. Has everybody got it? 
That's what tonight is about. Last night was about leadership principle, gearing us up to be good leaders of small groups. Tonight is going to be zoning in on vision for this church for small group. Next week is going to be the um, role of the facilitator in the small group, okay? So we'll be very specific from here on out, the role of the facilitator. What is the exact role and expectation of the facilitator? So we'll do that next week. And then the last week is going to be how to properly um, um, facilitate a small group. Does everybody got it? Or what the small group experience should be in that particular the session. Does everybody understand? Because we don't want you to be ill-equipped at all. I want you to be very equipped. Um, nothing catching you off guard. The last week, I think we're going to have some tips in there for you and so on and so forth. But by the time we're done this training, you will know exactly expectation. You'll know vision. You're going to know that tonight for small group. You're going to know what your role as the facilitator should be, and you're going to know how to properly um, facilitate a group. Has everybody got it? So that it's done in excellence, okay? And then after that, there's some other stuff I want to teach our small group leaders, but the four weeks doesn't allow. So after that, the first Saturday for that hour, we'll be doing some training, some additional training, answering questions, and showing the DVD. You'll, got, you'll get a chance to see that before um, the church does. Has everybody got it? Okay? Now, again, groups won't be starting until May. April, whoever goes through the training, completes it. We're going to bring you before the whole church. We're going to pray over you. We're going to endorse you, let the whole church know um, what type of group you're running or you're going to be offering, and then we're going to give a whole month of getting connected. April will be getting connected month where everybody will know what group you're, you're running and they'll have a chance as a church to choose what they want to do and get involved. Does everybody follow that? Come May 1st, the, you know, the, the beginning of May is when our groups will commence and you'll decide when your group is going to be. Okay, when it's going to be, how often it's going to be, whether it's going to be weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. Okay, it cannot be any further out than monthly, but you'll decide what it's going to be. Has everybody got it? Okay, now what will happen the first Saturday in May, before any groups commence, we'll have our leadership training. Um, that Saturday, you'll see the DVD in May. You'll get a chance to see the uh, DVD presentation, ask any questions about it, and then you'll go forward and have your groups throughout that month. Has everybody got it? Okay, so that's where we're headed from, from here, all right? And tonight's lesson is very, very good concerning. You won't have to write as much as last week. Praise the Lord. All right, now, look at the objective, okay? It says this lesson is designed to help believers understand the victory group's vision. It is critical that every victory group leader has a working knowledge of the vision and how it functions within the context of their overall vision of the church. So we need to make sure we understand that the small groups are operating under the vision of victory. Has everybody got it? It's not a separate thing. It's operating under the vision. So that means every small group should flow right within the vision of a victory. Has everybody got it? All right. Now, the introduction. God has set forth the pattern for the believer's life within the church in the book of Acts. Now go to Acts 2. Hopefully you brought your Bible because we looked at a lot of scripture last week and that'll be our pattern. Acts chapter 2. Okay, let's look at the pattern that's set forth for the believer's life within the church. And the book of Acts does that. Okay, Acts 2 verse 46, please. Acts 2 verse 46. And again, if you have questions, try to hold them and we'll answer them at the end. <clears throat> Are you guys there? It says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You know, in the New Testament, the New Testament sets a tone that the believers, they were um, fellowshipping and studying with one another on a regular basis. It wasn't, you know, it, now we can't neglect that they weren't coming together corporately. We know they were doing that, but they were also, it wasn't just Sundays or whatever it was. It was also on a consistent basis of some type. There was fellowship and discipleship of studying the word. And that's a pattern. In other words, God really never intended for us to just come to church on Sunday um, and Wednesday and that's it. We need more than that as believers because the Bible says iron sharpeth iron. So we really need more than that. And that's where the small group principle comes in because it provides a context for people to get what they need over and above Sundays or corporate worship. 
Does everybody got it? Okay. Now, look at the next part there. It says, the Holy Spirit has impressed upon Pastor Aisha and I to lead our church into an effective saint-to-saint -saint ministry. It will be an exciting journey of faith as we implement small group ministry into our church family. Now, I want you to zone in on saint-to-saint -saint ministry there because saint-to-saint -saint ministry, um, it means just that. The, the Bible never talked about that everything's supposed to happen through the pastor. How many know it's supposed to be all the saints together? And everybody in this room brings a special element to this church. And saint to saint ministry releases that. It really does. It releases that for your gifts, your talents, your abilities to be released in ministering to somebody else. And that's all about being fruitful, right? And so that's what we're going after. We're going after really getting a strong saint-to-saint -saint ministry going through small group so that people aren't dependent on me or Pastor Aisha or the elders. I really believe it's actually more effective when it comes from one of their peers. And, and here's why, why last week's lesson was so vitally important, because everybody in this room should basically be saying in principle the same thing that Pastor Aisha and I say. You might say it a different way with your personality, but in principle, it should be the same. What that does is when they hear me say something about your family ought to be tight, when they hear me say your relationship with God, you know, has to be first. Well, a lot of people could say, well, that's pastor. He should say that. But when they look at somebody else that's appear to them and hear the same thing, it reinforces what I said, but it takes the excuse away. Well, pastor should say that. Say, I follow me. So Saint to Saint ministry is so vitally, vitally important. But the challenge for us, we had to really seek God and say, how should it be done here? And we desperately need it because of the size of this church. Has everybody got it? Okay, now, under Roman number one, the fundamentals of vision implementation in the kingdom. Okay, how do we really go about implementing this thing? Letter A, the order of God is that men work together for a common vision. Now, number one, write this in. Jesus selected 12 men to help in his vision. Jesus selected 12 men to help in his vision. There's something about the number 12, and it's not spooky and 12. It's, it's not that, but there's something special about 12. You see Jesus operating in 12 or less a whole lot, okay? Do y'all have that statement? Now, go to Matthew 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. <clears throat> But again, the order of God is that men work together for a common vision. So Jesus brought a group of people together to help in his vision because it's the order of God that people work together for a common vision. Matthew 10, verse 1. You have it? And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So he brought these people together for them to help in his vision. It's something about people rallying together to accomplish vision. Does everybody understand? Now, uh, one of the things I want you all to be mindful in this whole thing is, you know, you know, our church, the size that it is, and it's, it's getting bigger and bigger every week. Even though everybody's hearing the vision, we push vision that most churches do. They hear it and so forth. It's really hard for a group that size to all get on the same page like that. It takes breaking the people down in chunks and having somebody help facilitate what that vision is. Does everybody follow that? To help get the, the whole group on the same page. Does everybody follow me? In other, in other words, if we don't do what we're trying to do, it'll be hard for us the bigger we get to get everybody on the same page. This provides a vehicle to attempt to do that. And I say attempt because we're not forcing people to get involved in this. We're not assigning people as a new member. They're not going to get assigned. That's not what it's about. It's about them getting assigning themselves because they have the same passion that you do. Does everybody follow that? Okay. Now, look at number two. Write this in. Moses delegated part of his vision management. Moses delegated part of his vision management. Again, men work together for a common vision. Moses delegated part of his vision management. No vision can happen by itself. No vision can happen with one person. It takes a team, and it takes delegation of vision management. Does everybody understand? In other words, let me say it this way. Um, pastors who are insecure of themselves will not do small groups. They will not because... Um, when you start delegating, it means other people get a chance to be a blessing to other people. You follow me? 
And that's what we're doing. I don't need the accolade. I don't need everybody to go, my pastor is so special. Great. I'm glad you feel that way. That's nice. Makes me feel good. But it's nice that they can say somebody else was a blessing to them. You follow me? I don't need all the glory. Me and Pastor Aisha don't need to all come through us. No, it's good that we can delegate vision management and have other people that can step up and be a blessing. Does everybody follow that? All right, Exodus 18. Are y'all there yet since your scripture reference is there? Can I say something? Yeah, that's why you have a mic, girl. Okay. Help yourself. Too. The one thing, too, that we know that everybody can't get everything from us as well. Right. Too. So we know that everybody that God brings in to victory is not just here to get, but they're also here to give. And everybody that comes in here has something to give to everybody that comes in. In, the, in here. And so there is a way that you can give based upon how you were made, based upon your passion, based upon your gifts, and based upon your talents. And so we really, really believe that this is going to be a, ve um, a vehicle in which the way God has made you, the way God has equipped you, now it gives you an opportunity to give back the gifts, the talents, the resources that God has given to you to make a difference now in somebody else's life. Amen. Amen. Okay, Exodus 18. Look at verse 17. It says, And Moses' father-in-law, this is an awesome delegation scripture. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Y'all see that? Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, of hundreds, fifties, and tens, I kind of skipped a little couple of the words. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee. But every small matter they shall judge, so it shall be easier for thyself, and thy shall bear the burden with thee. Does anybody see that? That's vision management delegation, and that's vitally, vitally important. The vision for victory can't expand if we're trying to hold it all to ourselves. It can expand if we're trying to just have us and the elders and ministers can't happen. It's too many people now in itself. It's going to take multiple folks coming on board and handling things and then bringing the hard matters, the ones that maybe you can't handle, bringing them. Has everybody got it? And we're going to talk about that more later on. Now, we're not expecting some churches when they do small groups, they're trying to get people to be small pastors. We're not expecting that. That's unfair because if you're not called to be a pastor, that will be a very uncomfortable thing. It takes a special person to be a pastor because pastors embrace the people and their problems as if they're their own. If you're not called to be a pastor, you're like, you know, I can't deal with this. You follow me? And I've seen that. We've seen that making people feel like they had to be pastors over these small groups. You know, the, the ones that, that struggle the most in this church are the elders because the elders are not necessarily called to be a pastor. But as an elder, it's as close to shepherding as you can get without having to be a pastor. Did I follow that? And so um, we're not expecting you to shepherd anybody. We're expecting you just to let God flow through you to be a blessing. Y'all see the difference? Okay. We'll leave the shepherding on me and Pastor Aisha so you don't get frustrated. Now, if you're called to be a pastor, you love it. Okay. You love, you know, you love it. I, I love the challenges. I thrive on it. It's like, come on, give me a best shot. I thrive on it um, because I look at it like my kids. You follow me? But what we do ask is that it be just only a form of accountability. You know, maybe if you see something going on with your brother and sister, encourage them maybe to reach out to the church. You know, have you talked to, have you called maybe as we get into membership care, have you talked to one of the ministers, the elders, or, or membership care? Or if, and if they haven't over a period of time, letting then the church know, listen, I noticed that my brother or sister was in need. Because as we said, the bigger we get, we're not going to be, as, be able to <coughs> be as hands-on as we would like to. But the more people that we are that are able to be hands-on, the more we can keep a closer touch on the people. Amen. And we're going to tie that in in a few minutes. All right. Now, uh, basic proven steps of vision implementation. How are we really going now um, implement it um, from the ground up? Number one, write this in goal. Goal. Okay? Goal. And a goal is a measurable objective. 
okay, measurable objective. When, um, if you want to be able to, to uh, see are you making progress, you got to have a goal, okay, because a goal is a measurable objective. So we have to have a goal. Now, for us, we want to, this year, we want to launch anywhere from 25 to 40 groups this year before the year is out. That's what we're going after. I believe we can hit it, and I believe you guys are the start. Because I believe what's going to happen is as people get involved in small groups, they're going to want to do their own. They're going to get in it and enjoy it and want to do their own. So we're believing a minimum 25 um, that we can start this year. Okay, I'd like to see closer up to 40, but minimum 25. Does everybody follow that? And you guys are the front runners. You're the pioneers in this. And out of you is going to come. You're going to, it's going to come other groups. Everybody got it? So we have a goal. For us foundationally, the goal is to get our small group ministry up and running. Okay, get it up and running, and then allow itself to diversify as we go. Number two, write in game plan. Game plan. Game plan. And the game plan is the well-thought-out strategy to reach the goal. Okay, the well-thought-out strategy to reach the goal. And we have that. You know, the strategy first was we had to put the word out to see who was interested in, in getting training. Then we have the training. Then after we have the training, we're going to graduate the people. And then after graduating the people and endorsing them so the body knows these are, are the ones. We're going to have a month of commitment, a commitment month, get connected month. People have a chance. Then we're going to have ongoing training, and the groups are going to start, okay? There's a game plan. It's not like let's just do it. There, there's a process. Everybody follow that? And this is the most important part. The training is the most important part of the process. Number three, group, group. Group, and that's that's us in this room. That's the selected people committed to work the game plan. Y'all got it? By the time you're done, you, again, you're going to know how to run a group. You're going to know what's expected of you. You're going to know how to handle problem solving. You're going to know who to go to. We're going to give you all that in, in the next three weeks on top of what we gave last week, okay? And so the group of the people that are committed to work the game plan. We're not looking for anybody to do their own thing. We're looking for you to work within the system. We're not looking for your revelation. Work within the system. Has everybody got it? Now, if your revelation is our revelation, praise God. But we're not looking for anything new, anything deep. You know, no, just work the system. If we work the system, the system will work. Amen. All right. Then there's gold. Gold. And that is the financial commitment required to work the game plan. The financial commitment required to work the game plan. And that's things like tools that we put in people's hands, investing in better camera equipment so we can do a higher grade of recording and giving everybody, you know, the DVDs. And if somebody doesn't have a DVD player working out, you know, making the financial commitment so that we can get the small group ministry up and running. Does everybody understand? Okay. Then there's government. Okay. Government. And I should have just had you put Chelsea in there, but there's government. And that's the oversight and management of the process. Okay. Oversight and management, the process. God blessed us with um, Chelsea, who is strong administratively. She is strong, strong administratively. And she, um, you know, when we first put it out there, you know, we, we were like, God, how are we going to do this? We need this. We need oversight. And Chelsea stepped up to the plate, which really let us know there is a God. He stepped, she stepped up and said, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to be administrative support. How can I help you? And so she's been helping us get this stuff together. And um, she has some training that she has to work on to help us in our our, uh, our um, system, our inputting system, but she's going to help Pastor Aisha and I with the oversight so we can make sure the groups are running to the standard of excellence that we need. Does everybody follow that? But y'all see how God just brings it together? Okay. All right. So everybody got that? Yes? All right. Now, let's look at small group vision. Okay. Some information. All right. And it says the mandate, divinely ordered assignment. It says this aspect of ministry for victory was given to us by the Holy Spirit after seeking him about small groups over the last two years. Now, we tried to do small groups a few years ago, but in a way that really was ineffective. And we found that out later on. Okay. It was ineffective. And so we've been really seeking God about small groups almost since the inception. Not quite. Probably, what, two years in? So two years in, we, um, we did it, but we did it in a way where we tried to make people do it, all types of things. And um, we learned from it, said, praise God. Um, we found out why it didn't work. But over the last two years, Pastor Aish and I have aggressively been seeking God on how he would have us do small groups to be successful. Has everybody got it? Now, look what it says. It is critically important. Um, a side note. What we did, so you know, is because I'm a my wife and I were a firm believer. It's not working. Shut it down. And we, you know, we have no game, shame in our game. If it's not working, 
shut something down, the principle stays the same, we change the method. Does everybody follow that? How many of you can't be scared to fail either? You know, because you don't grow unless you fail. Okay? Something's not working, we try a different way. You know, pray. You don't forsake the principle, just go at a different method. All right. It says it is critically important to understand that after a church reaches past the realm of being small, it becomes extremely difficult to control attrition. There seems to be steady growth within our church family, but there has also been some spiritually young believers and disgruntled believers falling through the cracks, preventing the church from becoming a, revol a revolving door where new members come in the front door, then escape out the back door. Y'all got me? Can be a major challenge for churches who are experiencing church growth. This process of maintaining the membership or closing the back door is a challenge for churches that adhere to the traditional church membership care methods. So I got that. And so this is this is really what we're implementing. Small group is really a result of our growth. When um, we had 50 people, we, we didn't need it because we could really oversee everybody there. When we had 100 people, you know, it, it began. It, it was too much from Pastor Aisha and I, but um, the elders, 150, 200 elders, ministers. You know, 250, 300 different leaders and so forth. But as you start going into 400, 500, you know, and over and where we are, it's 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 not enough with the people that we have. So I follow that, and so now we have to have a more intense, aggressive plan to oversee so that people don't fall through the cracks. We don't want a revolving door. We don't want people coming in and because their needs are not getting met, nobody knows about it, they're out the back door. So if I follow that, this is an opportunity to nip that. Now, um, we're again, we're not assigning people, but I'm not concerned about that because people, as long as we offer something, then people can't blame us for not offering something. So if I follow that, that's what this is about. That's why we're not making people. But if after we get this system in place, if somebody falls through the cracks, they can't blame the ministry because it means they're not taking advantage of the systems. And the one thing that we have learned from from going through different conferences and different statistical reports that the really the number one reason that most people stay in churches today is because of relationships. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we really feel that this is a really viable way is to go about doing small groups because it provides a way for people to build relationships as we're growing um, larger but maintaining smaller but in a way where people feel as if I can relate to people in some way. They can join a group based upon something I can relate to and feel like I can belong to and build a relationship in the process versus going to a group and feeling as if I can't relate to the people at all. So that's Amen. why we really feel that this could possibly work. Amen. Now look at the next part. Pastor Aisha and I need your help in building a caring community of faith that lovingly touches the unsaved, newly saved, untaught, unchurched, and the uncommitted transforming them into devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're trying to, those are the ones that will fall through the cracks. Okay, a mature believer um, most likely won't. But your immature, um, unchurched, untaught, those are the ones that can fall through the cracks. So we're trying to make this where everybody benefits. Mature believers who are like, hey, that's my passion, so it's more fellowship and so forth. But the immature, the uncommitted, the untaught, undiscipled, we need them as well. And so a like passion uh, ministry will cause them to possibly ignite and say, hey, I want to get involved in that group because it's what I like doing. So it covers everybody. Does everybody follow that? Okay. Now, look at letter B. It says the mission, the scriptural process of making disciples, the revival of the saint to saint ministry in the local church. And then we have there the one to another ministry is the New Testament pattern. And I want to take you through Scripture and show you this pattern. Number one, write this in, attend to one another. Attend. The one to, one to another ministry, this pattern, number one, attend to one another. In this one to another ministry, we're to, uh, uh, you know, it's attend to one another. James 1, please, we're to attend to one another. Attend to one another. You know, it's funny because as you really study stuff like this, you realize it was never meant for the corporate church to really stay on top of the people. The corporate church was a place for us to gather corporately in worship and have needs met. They could come and have needs met and so forth. But in terms of the, the personal discipleship and accountability, it was broken down within amongst themselves. 
You had leaders of the minute of the church, but then there were, everybody was accountable to somebody. You got you follow that. So look what it says. James 119. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, the reason that's important is because the only way you can attend to somebody else is if you exercise that. OK, if you're swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, because many times I need to shut up and listen. You know, I learned a lesson one time because I don't know who it was. It might have been Elder Yolanda, maybe, because we've been in a relationship with Elder Yolanda. If you look in the Bible, it says, in the beginning, it says there was pastors and Elder Yolanda. We've been in a relationship for 16 years, 15, something like that, years. And um, not knowing God was bringing us together, her and our family, for, you know, what we're doing. But I remember, I th I'm not sure it was her, but she came to us one time with a problem. And as soon as she started talking, I listened for about a minute. I said, I got your solution. Do this, 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 and it'll work out. And she's like, Pastor, you know, I wasn't pastor then. She said, you know, I really wasn't coming for an answer. I just wanted you to listen. And I was like, oh. It was a good, you know, I don't know if it was her or not. It probably was, probably was. But um, good lesson. You know, but also, too, what we teach, if any, anybody here took our counseling, you went to our counseling school? Okay. What, one of the things we taught our counselors is this, is um, if you, you know, you can't, you're not getting the accurate picture of any conversation in the first five minutes. You got to listen because many times when people are coming to talk, they're not giving you all the details up front. And you got to kind of peel the, the banana or the apple. You got to peel it back to get to the root. Does everybody follow that? So we really got to be able to attend to one another by talking less and listening more up front and not, even if we're angry, not letting it show up front. Does everybody got it? Because my anger can shut somebody down. Okay? All right, number two, love one another. Again, this saint to saint ministry, these really are foundational principles for a successful saint to saint ministry. Love one another. So we attend to one another, but then we have to love one another. Okay, Romans 12, verse 10. It says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Y'all see that? Yes? And so we have to love one another, okay? If, if, if we're going to have a successful saint-to-saint -saint ministry, then individuals need to know they're loved. They need to know that they are loved. Now, it's, it's easy. it should be easier in this church because everybody feels the love when they come in here. We get that on our surveys all the time. People just feel the love of God from the time they walk in the door. Now, side note, I, gotta, I found out I got to rebuke the church starting tomorrow night because I found out we're not showing love with the children, I know it's crowded, and our children's ministry, they line up like an hour ahead of time, but I found out people are cutting in front of one another. And somebody just cut in front of a visitor just recently. So, you know, now whether they're a visitor or not, I'm like, don't cut in front. Wait your turn. You follow me? Wait, and if you don't get in that week, okay, praise the Lord. You know, you follow me? But how many know it's important that we show love one to another? Yeah, they gave their kids to somebody else. I hope that was not anybody up in here. But they gave the kid, you know, you don't do that. But we got to love one another. Number three, write this down. We have to build up one another. Build up one another. So we attend to one another. We love one another. We got to build up one another. Okay, Romans 14. Don't cut in front of each other. <laughs> build up one another. Romans 14, verse 19. Romans 14, verse 19. It says, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Everybody see that? Again, we're talking about a saint-to-saint -saint ministry. Now, how many realize a lot of these things can't happen intimately on a large scale? It takes broken down into smaller groups. And that's what the saint-to-saint -saint ministry, our small group ministry, is all about. So build up one another. Number four, write this in, accept one another. Accept one another. So we attend to one another, love one another, build up one another, accept one another. Romans 15, verse 7, accept one another. Saint to saint ministry, small group ministry, there has to be acceptance in the group. Acceptance, okay? We accept you unconditionally. Accept one another. Romans 15, 7, Where, wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Did God accept us unconditionally? Then we have no right to put conditions on our acceptance of other people. Amen. So we accept one another. Number five, write this in, care for one another. Care for one another. Care for one another. So we attend to one another. We love one another. Build up one another. Accept one another. Care for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25. 12, verse 25. Okay. 
Are you there? It says that there should be no schisms in the body. Y'all see that? But that the members should have the same what? Care. care one for another. So there should be care. Now, these apply in the church. This isn't just saint to saint ministry. But where these things are amplified or magnified is in small group ministry. Okay, and if we're going to have successful, if our small group ministry is not going to become cliquish, these must be there. So if I got it, we're not trying to have cliques, okay? Not, no, no, no. This is an unconditional acceptance of people with like passion, okay? So care for one another. Where were we? Number six? Number six, write this in. Serve one another. Serve one another. Serve one another. Okay, Galatians 5, verse 13 Galatians 5, verse 13. And I think this will be your last bit of writing for tonight. Praise the Lord. And you just got to read with me. Galatians 5, verse 13. You got it? For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You see that? Okay? But by love. See, how many know when you serve, it should be an act of love? It really could. If you truly have a servant's heart, it's an act of love. You follow me? I, you know, I, 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 I love serving you. Say, so I got that? And we serve in different capacities and different ways and so forth. But, uh, you know, I was talking with, uh, you know, we were having a meeting earlier today in staff, and we were, I was somehow, I was, I was bringing up and talking about that at our old church. You know, I, I, I love serving. I'm a server. I, I am. I love. Anybody here really just a server? Okay, I mean, we're all supposed to be, but I mean, I love serving. I get joy. And when we first started this church, we had to make a change because we were so used to serving others. We had a hard time letting people serve us. You know, when my pastor was alive, I loved serving him. You know, the old church, I cut my teeth in ministry. I loved serving that pastor. I loved serving people. I loved serving that pastor. I loved carrying his bag. I loved helping him. I loved, you know, when stuff needed to be done. You know, he would get done preaching and want to try to help. And I would say, Pastor, I got it. You go at home. I got it. You know, when we were in that church, we were in hotels. We were in schools. We were, you know, we were all over. And um, it was my honor and privilege to serve, you know. And, I mean, you know, I didn't always feel like it, but I loved serving. You follow me? And, you know, how much more, you know, if, if I'm going to serve somebody in authority, how much more should I serve somebody not in authority? You know, where to serve. The, the picture of Jesus washing his disciples' feet is the epitome of servanthood. That, I mean, if you, really, if you really think about it, that's God in flesh. The creator serving the creation. You follow me? And if you really want to get technical, when it comes to Judas, you know, because the Bible says at that point Satan had entered the heart of of Judas, you had God washing the feet of Satan. Are you following me? Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Because Judas at that point was a body. Satan had his heart and his mind. You got it? Now, how many know if God can, can serve Satan, you sure enough can serve somebody you feel has the devil in them. <laughs> but we're to serve one another. You know, as leaders, we should never get so high-minded that we need somebody to serve us. Or that we feel that we're above anything. You find, when we first started this church, they, you know, they tried to pull on me, you know, well, I mean, and I'm talking about embryonic. We first started, you know, Pat, no, we had moved, we were about like, six months old, a year old. But we had moved in here and um, we were putting chairs away. And they're like, Pastor, we'll do it. We'll do it. I said, no, no, no. I said, I need to do this so y'all can see me do it. So you know that nobody's above it, not even me. Does anybody follow that? Okay. Vitally important serving. If you don't have a servant's heart, God can't really use you. You gotta have the heart of a servant wanting to serve. I'm above nothing. And when you really have a servant's heart, it saves you a lot of frustration. Because when I have a servant's heart, I don't have expectation of too much. You follow me? When my wife and I, we, you know, when we go into churches and so forth and they know we're pastors, we don't have expectation to sit on the front row. I can, I can hear the same on the back row. You follow me? I can hear the, I know um, we were in Cali not in California, we were in um, Atlanta. And um, you'll get a kick out of this. We were in Atlanta and, uh, you know, with Pastor Godot a couple months ago. And uh, people got born again, and they didn't have no harvest team at that church. So he looked at all the pastors and said, y'all the harvest team tonight. So we got up, got behind them, put our hand on the shoulder, and uh, took them in another room. And then we were all we were cramped. I didn't feel bad for us. We were cramped. <laughs> And people are, some people had gotten saved, so we're ministering. Some got, you know, came up for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So all in the same room in cramped quarters, people are getting baptized in the Holy Ghost, getting renewed to the Lord, joining the church, you know. And it, and it but, you know, I didn't, take the, I didn't take the mentality, I'm above this. I was like, that's what's needed at that moment. Let's do it. 
And when you have a servant's heart, that's how you are. You know, my title does not put me above anything. Matter of fact, my title should be a magnifier that if you look at me, you see what a true servant is. You got it? That's what makes me, you know, honor Brother Rothwell so much. He's a, he's a man of great stature, great power in the military. But just sitting with him, you would never know. That's, that's a servant. And that's a Jesus principle. The woman at the well never knew she was talking to God in flesh. You know, he didn't walk up like he was all that. He just walked up, you know, just like a regular person with a heart to serve. Does everybody follow me? Vitally. Vi Did I drive the point home? So if you act up, we kick you out. We serve you by kicking you out the door. All right. Number seven. Now, this is vitally important. Write this in. Forgive one another. Forgive one another. We need some forgiveness. Forgive one another. Vitally important. Forgive one another. Okay, and that's what should be happening in these groups. These groups should be attending to one another, loving one another, building up one another, accepting one another, caring for one another, serving one another, forgiving one another. Okay, Ephesians 4 verse 32. It says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That just sets the standard for my forgiveness. My, my measurement of forgiveness is based upon God forgiving me. Therefore, there's nobody that I can't forgive. You follow me? Now, let me, let me say something to you. These groups, we want them to become like little communities. We want them to, to become groups of 8 and 12. And it might be less than that, but groups where people know that's my group. That's, that's, that's my, my, my family within the large family. You follow me? Again, not clickish, but they know this is a group I can count on for what I need. If I can't get it from anybody else, I can get it from that group. Y'all follow me? I can get it from them. I can get what I need from this group. And hear me, this ministry, though it's embryonic in form, is going to become a vitally, one of the most important ministries in this church the larger we grow. Because this is going to be one of the only ways that people will not get lost. This is how important this is. You follow me? It's, it's harder for them to get lost. It's, it's easier than it used to be in this church, but it's not as hard as it will be when we go over 1,000 and 2,000 and so on and so on. It'll be, this will be so vitally important. So we got to act like it's the most important ministry now. Has everybody got it? All right, and then number eight, write this in, pray for one another. Pray for one another. So we should be attending to one another, loving one another, building up one another, accepting one another, caring for one another, serving one another, forgiving one another, and praying for one another. James 5 verse 16 says this, confess your faults one to another, pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Okay, this, these groups are going to have to be built upon prayer. In other words, every time we get together, there's some element of prayer. You know, we're going to show you that there should be praying for prayer needs in this group. You know, if there's prayer needs, come on, let's pray. If so-and-so is having a rough time in their family, we don't need to get all in their business with that woman, but let's pray for them. You follow me? Let's just take, and we don't got to do a real deep prayer, but let, let's pray. You know, what are the prayer needs? Well, you know, my child is sick. Let, let's pray. You follow me? There's, there's a semblance of prayer. It can't be we just open in prayer. There has to be praying for one another. I ain't talking about having somebody in the corner and praying. So I'm going to ask a group. We corporately, we exercise our faith, believe in God to meet the need of, the, one, of the, one of our family members in this group. Say, I got it? Okay. All right. Now, so that's the mission, okay? That's the mission, reviving the saint to saint ministry, and that's what it's based on. Say, I got it? Now, let's look at the method, okay? The method. The method. It says the systematic application of a plan of action. So you can put your pen down outside of just taking some notes, side notes of maybe something we say. Since the inception of this church, we've been led by the Spirit of God to develop a solid membership care infrastructure. That's always been on our heart. We've always wanted to have a way to help the membership. Does everybody follow that? Always, always, always we've wanted to have some type of membership care. Small, whatever, but something so that if somebody needed help, they could get what they needed, okay? Look what it says. The direction God is moving us into is not to imply that there is a rumbling of dissatisfaction within the leadership or membership care. Quite the contrary. 
It is the principle of divine increase that when one is proven faithful over the present assignment, God chooses to expand the assignment and the responsibilities. In every generation, God seeks out a people he can use on a consistent basis to bless their generation and future generations. God has demonstrated his good pleasure towards us through the supernatural results in ministry. What's happening in this church is supernatural, okay? You, you don't grow like we're growing in the environment that we're in. You hear me? People don't understand about coming to a church in a shopping center. They don't understand that. But the growth we're experiencing, we're experiencing more growth in this church than some churches that are in a single unit is experiencing. You follow me? What we've seen over seven years and change, supernatural. We've seen miracles take place. We've seen families restored. We've seen people that have been jacked up by a spouse get healed. We've seen all types of stuff. It's been, it's, and it's been God. Nobody can take credit outside of him. My preaching couldn't do that much. You follow me? It's God. All right? Look what it says. God is expanding the assignment of ministry. He has given victory in Christ. The present way we care for our membership will remain in place. Keep that in mind. And continue to serve as the mainstay in membership care. All members will be directed to contact the church in the event of their need as they have done in the past. The victory groups will be incorporated into the line of membership care with the full backing of our staff. So again, we're not looking for anybody, we're not looking for a small group ministry member to meet the need of a person. We're not looking for that. We're not looking for um, if somebody has to have their electric bill paid. We're not looking for the small group to come out of their pockets and meet the need. Now, if God supernaturally says that in that moment, we wouldn't stop people, but we're not doing that. This is an accountability like Pastor Aisha was saying, so that if somebody needs financial assistance, if somebody needs counseling assistance, if somebody needs whatever type of assistance, if that group leader is made aware, then what we need that group leader to do is encourage the person to contact the church. Yeah, say, listen, you need to call the church. They, you know, we have benevolence set up. We have counseling set up. Whatever the case is, you know, you need to contact the church and they can help you. But then what we want you to do is on your own to call the church and let one of the elders know such and such in my group, they're gonna, they should be calling. They're going to need some assistance in whatever way. And I told them, I referred them to call the church. Now what that does is it brings us involved into the person's situation that we might not have never known without you and that small group uh, ministry. Does anybody see that? Got it? That's what we're talking about, okay? We're not asking you to meet any needs. I am asking you to pray for them and, and provide oversight of accountability, of knowing that they're still connected, knowing that they're, they're coming to church. But if they have a need, because people will leave churches when their needs aren't met. If they have a need, we're not looking for you to meet it. We're looking for you to have them tell them, you need to call the church tomorrow. Call us, speak to one of the elders, okay? Call them. Now, if everybody does their job right, we're going to work the elders some more, okay? But what we're doing, because our elders can't handle it all, we're raising up our counseling team, okay? So if we work, but now, somebody needs financial assistance, LD Yolanda heads up our benevolence, and so now they can call, and LD Yolanda can give them direction. You need to come in, fill out our application, and so forth. Yeah, our basic care ministry called Helping Hands Ministry is being established. So that, you know, let's say, let's say um, there's an elderly person. And let's say it doesn't even, let's say they're not even in your group, but one of the members in your group was fellowshipping with a person, an elderly person who needs assistance, and um, we don't know about it. Now they tell you for some reason, you tell them, look, go back, tell the person, call the church, but then you call and say, you know, such and such in my group was telling me that sister so-and-so should be calling. They're, you know, they're going to need help. Does anybody follow that? Okay, now, what happens now, we, um, we, at the bigger we get, we don't know who that person is. We can go into Fellowship One, pull their name out. You follow me? And if they don't call in a few days, now their church can reach out and go, we heard that you needed some help. How can we help you? Are y'all seeing what I'm saying? Now we're taking the net and we're putting it on the back door and we're making sure that anybody who's part of this church, their needs are taken care of. Is that a good thing? OK, but our our job is to meet the needs, but it's not our job to, you know, to find out the need. You follow me as a church? We could be we're too big for that, but we can put something in place to bring that to light. Does everybody see what we're expecting on that aspect of what we're not? 
We're not expecting you to uh, take them to the doctors. We, you know, we're not now, you know, in that small group ministry, you know, if somebody needs a ride somewhere, we might say, hey, so-and-so needs a ride. Can somebody from the group take them? But we're not expecting you to be the end-all problem solver. We want our small groups to be there as an informant for us so that we can be there to help meet the need outside of what the group can't do. Does anybody follow that? If some, you know, if somebody in the group can take the person to the grocery store, take the person to the doctor, great. But like Pastor Aisha said, the, the, the Helping Hands ministry is going to be established so that we have a whole list of people that just love driving folks to the store. So now, you know, we don't even need the small group to do it. Pick up the phone, call, and now the Helping Hands ministry can get involved and say, hey, such and such needs to go get medication or whatever. We go take them. You follow me? No matter how big we get, we can handle the group. What this is saying to God is, God, we're up. Well, I'm jumping ahead, so we'll, we'll wait. Okay. Does everybody got it? All right. Now, the victory group's vision. Okay, the victory group vision. Does everybody see where I am? Okay. It says, as God has blessed our church and caused it to experience continual growth, there has been a focus of implementing a system that would successfully transform new converts into disciples while also providing effective membership care, which would prevent people and their needs from falling through the cracks. And again, that's what we're after. We don't want um, people's needs. We haven't had a whole lot, but we have heard after the fact about some things, and uh, that's only going to intensify as we grow. It says this system will be lived out in victory groups. A victory group is a group of 8 to 12 people or couples brought together under the common vision of the church with common interests and passions, working together to advance the kingdom of God. Together, working with other victory groups, they purpose to fulfill the vision assignment under the direction of the church, staying under authority and being accountable to each other and for each other. Has anybody got that? Yes? So we're talking about people coming together and holding one another accountable under the vision and authority of the church. Has everybody got it? Okay. Now, look at the next thing. A facilitator, which is a leader of the group, will oversee the group meetings to make sure things are done decent and in order. So we don't want a, a bunch of folks in there doing what they want. You know, that's why we're doing the training. We want a group facil a facilitator, a group leader, making sure that the, the evening meeting or the day meeting, whatever it is, is being done decent and in order. Everybody got it? Beyond the meeting, the facilitator, and I'll pay attention to this part, will serve as a helper to the pastors in keeping in contact with and encouraging the members. Of course, all members are expected to be in Sunday and Wednesday worship. Now, that's important, okay, because your group is not to take the place of church worship. You follow? Even though they're going to get a lesson, they're going to hear from me, me and Pastor Aisha, that is not to be their Sunday word on a Saturday you know, or something like that. But they are expected to be in Sunday Wednesday worship and to be involved in other church functions and activities. Each time the group is scheduled to meet, the facilitator should receive a call from each of the members in their group who does not attend the victory group meeting. Has anybody got that? If they're not coming, they should call you. Okay? This in-touch call is just a simple call designed to inform the facilitator that all is well. So you realize sometimes people aren't going to be able to make the group. For whatever reason. And you want, you're going to want to set that up front. That, you know, every time we're scheduled to meet, if you can't make it, just give me a call so that I know you're okay. See if I got it? You don't want people just to show up when they feel like it and, um, and you not know. You want them to know, you know, if you can't make it, it's cool. Nobody's forced to come. But I want to know that you're okay. Have I got it? Okay. It says, should the facilitator not receive the call, the facilitator is expected to follow up on that member of the group. If there are challenges and problems, well, let's stop. So if you don't hear from them, okay, in a couple days, we want you to be mindful that I didn't hear from Frank. I didn't hear from Susan. Pick up the phone. Hey, Susan, I didn't hear. You weren't, you know, you weren't at, you know, at our group, our small group meeting, and I didn't hear from you. Are you okay? It's not like, where were you? How come you didn't show? You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see you there. I didn't hear from you. You know, we ask everybody to call just so we know you're okay. Is everything all right? This way, if Susan has gone into a funk, or a depression, she had an argument with her husband and she's just overwhelmed or whatever the case is, or she got some bad news and she's beginning to shut down, we catch it right away. For an example, we've had a, a couple members, two, maybe two or three members just within the past two or three weeks that were involved in car accidents. Yeah. And, you know, and some of them we kind of heard through other people through the grapevine is wasn't that they even, you know, called to even tell the church. 
So, you know, that would help, again, to be as accountability just to make sure that everybody is okay and do they yeah. need anything or what's going on. Now, one of the things we're going to want to have the group do, if let's say one of the members of the group was in a car accident, we're going to want the group to rally around them. And I'm going to want y'all to set that tone that, hey, because you want this to become a, a, a family because we're not going any more than 12 people or 12 couples. That's it. So you want this to be a family. Okay, once we hit 12, nobody else can come in. Okay, the only way somebody else could come in is if somebody leaves to start a group. Then you can add a person in. Does anybody follow that? Okay. But if somebody's in a car accident, we want the group to rally. So everybody in the group should give them a call. Hey, heard something happened. Are you okay? Do you need anything? It'll be awesome. Let's say somebody had a death in their family. The first people on the scene should be their small group. Their small group. You know, just let's pray. You know, if, if, at the hospital, let's pray. That should be the first group on the scene. But the small group leader should pick up the phone, call the church. Such and such has had a death in their family. Now we can get hospitality involved. You follow me? Hospitality, a minister, an elder, or whatever the case involved. So that family that was, was hit with that tragedy has a whole support system that's tied in. You got it? Does everybody see how this to happen? So as you get your group together, and it's going to be easy because it's going to be like passion.